Let me also just say about Jacob Neusner that as much as Jacob Neusner did famously write an article called How Much Iranian in the Babylonian Talmud, with the answer being not very much, he was uh, one of the most important scholars to have worked uh, on, on this region and on this field. He has five very important volumes that are still extremely important, if you're interested in the topic, called The History of the Jews in Babylonia. And uh, although I barely had the pleasure of meeting him at the end of his life, uh, he passed away just about a year ago, the conversation that we did had, have was about the importance of this, uh, of this work. He didn't retract the article, but he does see that this endeavor of trying to, as we'll see, locate uh, the Iranian Talmud in its Iranian context is an important uh, project. So without further ado, let's really start at the, at the beginning. And the beginning is the heart of the traditional Jewish canon, which is not the Hebrew Bible, arguably, but is actually a very bewildering text known as uh, the Talmud. The Talmud is a gyrating and relentless engagement with another text called the Mishnah, which Professor Lappin has devoted uh, much of his research towards. The Mishnah was composed about 200 of the common era in Roman Palestine, and it's the foundation of rabbinic law. So when we think about the Talmud, as we'll soon see, we need to think about a sort of second order text uh, that's engaged with explaining, commenting upon, and actualizing uh, the Mishnah. The Mishnah was a legal text. Uh, we can call it a legal textbook. Um, the Talmud is very much legal, but also ends up doing many other things. Now, if we want to be more precise, there were actually two Talmuds in late antiquity. An earlier one was produced in uh, the Galilee about sometime during the fifth century of the Common Era. And it's inaccurately known as the Talmud Yerushalmi, as the Jerusalem Talmud. Uh, in fact, of course, it was composed uh, in the Galilee. The later, a later Talmud, right, which was compiled more than a century later, perhaps we'll get a chance to talk about precisely when or generally when, this is known as the Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud. And for most of its history, the Yerushalmi, that Palestinian Talmud, as we'll now call it, was either unknown or relatively uninfluential uh, on Jewish law and Jewish lore, while the Babylonian Talmud was dominant in the focus of uh, much study and inspiration. Uh, so even in 2017, if you look at curricula of yeshivas, rabbinical academies around the world, you'll find that the main staple remains uh, the Babylonian Talmud. And when we say the, the, the Babylonian Talmud is so kind of has won and is uh, supreme in its battle against the Palestinian Talmud. When we say the Talmud, and when I say the Talmud, uh, today I refer, as most uh, scholars do, to the Babylonian Talmud. Okay. Now, as scholars who are not in any yeshiva, we have an assumption uh, that perhaps the best way to study a text, to understand a text, to appreciate a text is by locating it in a chronological and geographical uh, context. Unfortunately, for, for a very long time, the, the Babylonian Talmud was not studied in this way, even within, even within the, the academy. And this is in contrast to the Palestinian Talmud, uh, which almost since the inception of the academic study of the Palestinian Talmud had been done within a framework of looking at it in, uh, alongside Greco-Roman literature, archaeology uh, from uh, Palestine and using all of those contextual and chronological tools uh, to, make, uh, to make sense of it. Um, so I'm part, as Professor Lappin said, of a school, a sort of movement, scholarly movement, to try to, to, to contextualize, to locate the Babylonian Talmud uh, in its uh, Sasanian context. And, and that's what we're going to do today. Right? We're going to see to the, ex the extent to which it's possible to locate the Babylonian Talmud in the Sasanian Empire and what exactly that, that means. So there's an old joke, at least I, uh, I have noted for a long time, that you ask students what color, in the history class, what color was George Washington's white horse? And usually you, you draw blank stares, I don't know, brown, black. The answer, of course, is that the horse was white. Uh, when we ask what, where the Babylonian Talmud was composed, right? What is it a product of, of course, 
the obvious answer is Babylonia. Right? The Babylonian Talmud is a product of, of Babylonia. Now, this reputation of the Talmud as Babylonian is very old. Uh, it, it, in other words, that Babylonia is a defining characteristic of the Babylonian Talmud. It goes back even to uh, the third century, perhaps, of the Common Era, uh, when rabbis, in this case Palestinian rabbis, appreciated Babylonian rabbinic learning, the kind of discussions that they had about the Mishnah, uh, as quintessentially, or from their perspective, tragically, Babylonian. If you could look just for a minute at the first uh, source in your handout, we have a little passage of Talmud, and this passage begins as follows. Babylonia. Rabbi Yochanan says, this refers to the fact that it is mixed, right? So Babylonian in Hebrew is Babel, and the word for mixed is Balul, or conjugated in the feminine, Blula, with scripture, Mishnah, and Talmud. We have a quote from the Biblical Book of Lamentations. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. Rabbi Yirmiya says, this is the learning Talmud of Babylonia. Okay. What, what's perhaps most notable about this passage is that it assumes that the toponym Babylonia refers not to a geographical place as much as to a type of learning that flourished uh, in that loca locale. So with all due respect to people perhaps of French origin or who work on different kinds of French scholarship, right? often in the academy, contemporary French scholarship is seen as sort of hopelessly French. Right? It's not just coincidental that certain French scholars worked in France, but this is somehow a key characteristic uh, when we think about even continental, uh, but especially French, uh, French scholarship. Something similar seems to be at work here also uh, with Babylonian rabbinic learning. Right? That somehow uh, Babylonia, when you say Babylonia, <laughs> or Babylonian, uh, you're referring to this kind of learning. Now, the, the Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, which grew out of these discussions, also was seen as inherently uh, Babylonian. So centuries later, even in the period immediately after the composition of the Talmud, in the Gaonic period, Rabbis living in Babylonia would refer to that Talmud as our Talmud, right? As opposed to their Talmud, the Talmud of Palestine, which they knew as the Western Talmud, because geographically, of course, <coughs> Babylonia, modern day Iraq, is to the east, right, of Israel, and therefore Israel is in the west, so the Palestinian Talmud is Western. Um, now, even if we know that there is this you know, deep association between Babylonian rabbinic learning and Babylonia, and that the Babylonian Talmud was quintessentially Babylonian, the question is, what does that mean? What does that do for us? Right? What, what can we make of that? Now, Rabbi Yochanan has, has something to say about this. Uh, it seems like a folk etymology. In fact, it is a folk etymology. Uh, but it actually should not be discounted, and it's quite insightful into a key characteristic that we'll come back to about the Babylonian Talmud. Right, so he claims, um, and he's riffing here on a famous biblical etymology of the name Babylonia. Right? The reason why Babylonia is, is, according to the Bible, is called Babylonia is because it was the place of babbling, right? where all the languages were, were mixed up. And this habit, by the way, of, of folk, folk etymologies about Babylonia uh, goes way back. We even have earlier ones uh, that refer to uh, it being the gate of the gods, Bab Eli, uh, which probably is not correct, but was a very common uh, folk etymology. So Rabbi Yochanan is saying, just as the Bible says about Babylonia, that there's some kind of mix-up of languages, mix-up mix of registers. Here it's not so much that one person is speaking Aramaic and another person is speaking uh, Persian, uh, but rather that there's a mixing of corpora, right, of different kinds of texts. It's a mix-up of, of scripture, right, the Bible, Mishnah, right, that, fir, that fountainhead of rabbinic uh, uh, law from the, 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 the uh, 200 CE uh, Roman Palestine, and the Talmud, the learning that grew up around, <laughs> around that, 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 um, that, that Mishnah. I think Rabbi Yochanan's insight is, uh, is important because it, um, 
for two reasons. One reason I will say for the very end of the talk, uh, and the other I'll, I'll describe right now. And that is the challenge that we face when we try to locate the Babylonian Talmud in its context, right? In Babylonia, or as we'll soon see, the Sasanian uh, Empire. If the Talmud is a kind of second order text, if its entire organization is as a commentary on a text that was composed elsewhere, the Mishnah, right? And the Mishnah, uh, the Mishnah kind of engineers a, a way of organizing knowledge, six orders, and within those orders, different tractates, and within those tractates, different chapters, and the Babylonian Talmud simply follows that organization, and, 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 and basically follows, uh, despite the tangents, the, the organization of knowledge that originated centuries earlier in Palestine. What does it mean, right, to study the Babylonian Talmud in its Babylonian context, right? It's not a sui generis work. It's not a work that was kind of composed anew uh, or for the first time in Babylonia. It's one that's fully consumed with a text that was written, composed uh, in another place uh, at an earlier time. And Rabbi Yochanan's description of Babylonia, Babylonian learning as being a mixing of registers, is very helpful uh, for us to appreciate the challenge that we face, right? You have a, you have a lot of Bible in the Babylonian Talmud. Its base is the Palestinian uh, Mishnah. Uh, so what, what exactly does it mean, and how do we go about um, appreciating it as a product of its time and place uh, of late antique Babylonia, okay? So I acknowledge that challenge. I, I, I like Rabbi Yochanan's uh, folk etymology uh, very much. And yet, as I'll argue today, uh, in fact, we are able to appreciate the Babylonianness of the Babylonian Talmud despite this mixing of registers, despite the fact that there's so much in there, so many different texts that were composed elsewhere. I think primarily the place to find the Babylonian-ness uh, of the Bavli, of the Babylonian Talmud, is in the space between the text that they are interpreting, the often Palestinian text that they're reading, and the, the, the moment of interpretation. That might sound abstract, and hopefully it will become a lot clearer. If we think about context, and we try to situate this complex text uh, in context, we actually have to take into account a number of contexts. We need to think about geography, right? How does the fact that the Babylonian Talmud was composed in a geographical space with its own unique, distinct topography, famously two rivers which uh, give us the name Mesopotamia, um, how does that right, affect uh, the shape and the growth and the evolution of the Babylonian Talmud? There's, of course, the political context uh, that we need to take into account. There's a cultural context, there's an interreligious context, there's, there are institutional contexts that are unique to Babylonia and are important, and there are linguistic contexts uh, as well. Now many of these uh, contexts, especially the political and institutional, uh, but not only, can be encapsulated in the word in the, the title of the lecture, which is Sasanian. Right? Of course, the Sasanians were a Iranian dynasty uh, specifically Persian from southwestern Iran, Fars, um, who ruled their, their reign over uh, the region was almost coterminous with, uh, with the development of the Talmud. They came to power approximately, depending on how you count, in 224 of the Common Era, and they fell from power in the 630s with the Arab conquest. So, right, we, we're talking about a dynasty that ruled for quite some time, for many centuries, over an enormous area. Uh, this isn't the best map, but this is a map of the different provinces of the Sasanian Empire. And this, to, this name, of course, is very useful for appreciating the political history of uh, the region, for the political features of the Babylonian Talmud, of its context. But not only, right, also the, the cultural, right? Also the interreligious, also the institutional, perhaps even the geographical. The ways in which the Sasanians saw space, shaped space, uh, sometimes even physically by diverting rivers <laughs> and doing that sort of thing, um, uh, was, uh, was, was part of the, the context in which the Babylonian Talmud uh, grew up. So therefore, 
you know, it, it, it also wouldn't have been the best title, but instead of have it talking about locating the Babylonian Talmud in Babylonia, it's actually more useful to think about locating the Babylonian Talmud in the Sasanian Empire, because many of the things that we're going to talk about are in one way or another distinctly Sasanian, right? are part of this sort of economy, this political economy, this cultural economy uh, that grew up in, uh, at, this, at this time and at this, at this place. So I'm a kind of philologically oriented uh, person. I like texts. Uh, I, I have a lot of texts in the handout. I don't know if we're going to see uh, all of them, but I thought it would be best uh, to illustrate some of the concepts that I'll be talking about uh, by, by way of the texts. That said, Right, I have like a different sections, the linguistic context. Some of my examples are, uh, you know, just random examples that I'm that I'm using uh, to illustrate some of these um, uh, some of these contexts. This is not at all, in other words, an exhaust exhaustive uh, handout. I thought I thought first we would talk about geography, uh, you know, and, and literally the place, as a city in Babylonia, as an important factor uh, when we want to contextualize uh, the Talmud. And once again. As I've been arguing, I kind of, when we want to contextualize the Bafli, we need to uh, take into account how the interpretation and the engagement with the Mishnah veers off into Babylonian directions, as opposed to Palestinian. Uh, so for example, in source number three, uh, 3a and 3b, we have a very typical Mishnah. Uh, the Mishnah uh, rules that if one received a field from his fellow to sow grain, so you were given a field uh, in order to, uh, to plant um, uh, grain in it, um, he may not sow beans. I actually see that the Hebrew, uh, I should have taken a text a little further down, but we'll just follow the English. Uh, to sow beans, he may, he may sow grain. Right? So if you, if you receive a field in order to uh, sow grain, you are not allowed to. It's considered to be a sort of breach of contract. Uh, to sow beads, legumes, uh, in, in their place. And however, if you receive that field to sow beans, then you are allowed to sow grains. Okay, just a typical random, if you're not ag agriculturally or legally minded, perhaps boring uh, Mishnah. Then in 3b, we have a uh, short discussion between two rabbis, Babylonian rabbis. Uh, Rav Yehuda is the name of this rabbi who taught um, if one received a field from his fellow to sow grain, he may sow beans, right? So he seems to disagree uh, and contradict the ruling of the Mishnah. Now, according, kind of, according to the rules of Talmudic discourse, once you live after the Mishnah, right? If you are not a rabbi who composed the Mishnah, nor a Satana, rather an Amora, you are not allowed to disagree uh, with the Mishnah. So the Talmud is presented with a problem, a post-Mishnaic sage seems to be ruling uh, in the exa exact opposite direction from the, from, from the Mishnah. The answer is an answer that appears time and again in the Mishnah, uh, and that is, um, this is not difficult. This ruling is for us Babylonians, and that ruling is for them, in other words, those Palestinians. Uh, presumably, and this is the approach taken by most commentators, the land, as we'll see, in, Pal in Palestine is, um, is not an easy land, and the land can be agriculturally very sensitive, so it really could create problems, and therefore would be deemed a breach of contract if you plant legumes in a field that's normally um, designated for, for grain. On the other hand, Babylonia, at least parts of Babylonia, were marshier, um, were less vulnerable, uh, you would be allowed to even plant legumes instead of uh, beets, right? So the ruling itself is not, is not a, as important as the, the very natural way in which the Talmud is willing to make distinctions and is very aware of the difference that place makes, right? That the Mishnah, as, as much as it is uh, a text that can't be contradicted, uh, one could say that it doesn't apply because of the space in which Babylonian rabbis are operating. I think a more interesting example um, that also has to do with marshiness, and I did not give you the source in the handout because it's a bit, uh, it's a bit complicated, but a, a more interesting example is when this process takes place unconsciously. In other words, Babylonian rabbis will interpret a Mishnah incorrectly, 
right? Or at least not according to its original meaning, uh, because of the geography, because of the topography. And one example actually comes from rabbinic nuisance law. So one is not allowed to do anything that one pleases in their own property if it affects your neighbor, right? That's the basis of, of nuisance law. And one of the things that you can't do is dig a water pit in, in some proximity to your neighbor's uh, own pit, okay? And this is a basic ruling uh, in the Mishnah. It doesn't seem to be very complicated. In the Babylonian Talmud, though, it becomes exceedingly compl complicated because they seem to not know one basic fact, or that fact is not part of their world. In Palestine, in the texts uh, that were written there, and also uh, um, archaeologically, it seems to have been a common practice to have a three handbreadth rim around water pits. And therefore, the mission didn't even have to define the the distance that you needed to uh, dig away from your neighbor's pit, uh, or define other things uh, as well. The Babylonian Talmud, though, is in a place where these rims were not necessarily standard, and because of that, they come to striking conclusions that basically, even if your neighbor doesn't have a pit, because he might make a pit there, and that pit would have natural walls, right, not rims, but just of, of the earth, then uh, that would be considered to be a nuisance, right? So sort of naturally, without even, um, without even realizing it, the Babylonian Talmud has created a new ru ruling, a, uh, a sort of radical ruling, always forbidding you to dig pits within any proximity to your neighbor's uh, property because of a difference uh, in, in how water pits uh, were made, okay? And again, geography uh, and topography uh, and things having to do with the ground are very important when we want to think about the Babylonianness uh, of, of, of the Bavli. I'd like to move on, though, to, to some other examples and to some other spheres where, um, where place makes a difference. And that has to do with language. So in Palestine, uh, of course, the rabbis seem primarily to have spoken Aramaic and a Palestinian kind of more Western branch of Middle Aramaic, uh, but they came into contact constantly with people who spoke other languages, especially and particularly Greek, uh, which was the lingua franca of this part of the, of the empire, of the Roman Empire. In Babylonia, right, you have a different linguistic context. Once again, the Jews in Babylonia and the rabbis who composed the Talmud speak uh, a, a dialect of Aramaic. We refer to this dialect as Babylonian Jewish Aramaic, it's more Eastern Aramaic, but it's still Middle Aramaic. Uh, but the people that they come into contact with uh, speak other languages. Some do probably uh, speak Greek, and those were people who had been moved often after um, military victories from the Roman Empire into the Sasanian Empire. But you also have people who speak Persian. Right? Of course, the Sasanians were a Persian people, and there were plenty of local Persians, even living in Right? Modern-day Iraq, which was historically uh, a, uh, an Aramaic-speaking speaking, uh, region. <coughs> this affects right, the Talmud on the most basic linguistic level, where we will have a good deal of Persian loanwords, uh, words that were taken from the Persian language and adopted by Jews uh, uh, and rabbis in speech, and therefore in the, in the Talmud as well. Um, but I want to talk about something even a little more interesting and surprising. Um, that goes beyond loan words and, and decisions to deploy certain Persian uh, phrases, and that is associations. Right? When you hear certain words and you're steeped in a, uh, a region where those words resonate in a certain way, right, you will come to read texts differently. And I have a sort of strange, uh, but deliberately strange example that I want to share with you, and that is uh, source number four uh, on the handout. This text comes from a very, right, Palestinian part of the Mishnah. It's a Mishnah that describes events that take place in Jerusalem when the temple was standing until 70 CE on the Day of Atonement, the holiest day on the Jewish calendar. And the uh, main character of that tractate is the high priest who would do, uh, who would do the service uh, in the Jerusalem temple. 
and there would be all sorts of immersions and purifications that he would undergo. The Mishnah tells us that all of these immersions, this is in 4a, all of them in the courtyard above the, we'll call it right now, the Parva chamber, except for this one. Okay, all you need to know is that there were immersions of the high, of the, on, that the high priest did on the Day of Atonement uh, in this place called the Parva chamber. Seems simple enough, right? In 4b, we have an exceedingly cryptic comment by a Babylonian rabbi who lived in the fourth century. What is the Parva chamber? Rav Yosef said, Parva Amagus. Right. So he seems to want some insight into the name or into the type of place that this temple chamber was. And he declares that the Parva is or somehow associated with a Magus, right? a Zoroastrian priest. What in the world does this mean? Right? And it's not just us asking that question. This question is asked by some of the earliest commentators in the Talmud that we have. So a, one important commentator from North Africa named Rabbeinu Hananel comes up with an ingenious explanation, perhaps some sort of tradition, that on the Day of Atonement, uh, it was sort of a spectator sport. Uh, people like to see kind of like golf, Right? You, would, you could only position yourself at a certain point uh, along the route, uh, not of the, uh, of the golf course, but of the, uh, the temple where you could see different services performed. And there was a Persian, a Zoroastrian priest, right, so he tells us, that wanted to see uh, part of the service. And the only way that he could, who, he could get there was to tunnel his way into this room known as the part not yet known as the Parva chamber. But once he did this, and his name was Parva, Rabbi Nochanel tells us, uh, this was so uh, memorable that they named the chamber <laughs> after him. Now we have to give credit to Rabbi Nochanel, whoever uh, came up, perhaps b before him, of his predecessors who came up with this uh, ingenious explanation. But it doesn't seem to, to really work. It certainly is completely not uh, historical. So. I, when I worked on this passage, I, I thought to myself, how will I be able to decode this? Where, where, where would I even begin? It's such a cryptic, kind of random comment by a rabbi linking a chamber of the temple with a Zoroastrian priest. And I, I did a sort of exercise with myself, and I thought to myself, sometimes, even if it has no meaning in the original language, because you, you know another language, there are certain associations, right? Sometimes these are even jokes uh, uh, that, that kind of flash when you see one word uh, in one language and you make a connection uh, with, uh, with, with another language. And I, first of all, began to see that there is a sort of association with this word, right, parva, or as we'll see, perhaps pronounced differently, that appears in two other places in the Talmud. So in four, sor, source 4c, we have another cryptic line. It's a catalog of kosher and non-kosher birds. And a way of memorizing it is, in a way of memorizing that the parva hunya bird, as we'll call it right now, is forbidden, is because parva amagus, right? What could be more non-kosher than a Zoroastrian priest, right? Um, that's a way of remembering that this, uh, that this bird is not kosher. Again, completely cryptic, but you seem to have a sort of linguistic association between this parva and this magus. And then I noticed another uh, source, uh, perhaps less strange, somewhat less strange, but still strange. Avital the barber, or perhaps the scribe, said in the name of Rav, Pharaoh, the contemporary of Moses, was a magus. And you have the same sort of sound there, though there is a different there's a kind of proof for this. Uh, and I realized that perhaps, instead of an association between the word parva, right, and magus, we in fact had an association between, as we have in the third source, the sound pharaoh, right, pharaoh or pharaoh, and a magus. Um, I then thought more deeply about this. And first of all, I remember that pharaoh is a very good Middle Persian word. Uh, that means blessing. Uh, and not only that, it was a word that was commonly used as a, as a name, kind of like the Hebrew Baruch, right? Uh, by people, by Persian-speaking uh, people. And it also appears 
time and again on stamp seals as a uh, as a kind of type, not a title, but a um, a flourish, right? That someone would write their name, some sort of bureaucrat would write, you know, uh, Ardashir Faroh, right? Blessed, and then he would stamp uh, stamp a document. So. We're still not having solved what exactly these rabbis are trying to say, there does seem to be a very common linguistic association between the word faroch and a magus, right, and a Zoroastrian priest. Perhaps this has to do with uh, the fact that many Zoroastrian priests were named faroch. This is difficult to prove, but it's quite possible. Perhaps it has to do with the fact that rabbis examining documents would constantly see, and we still have stamp ceilings that have the word Magus, right? Uh, Magosh, and different ver versions of it, Mago, Faroch, next to one another, and they would make this association. But the association does seem to be between a Persian word meaning blessing uh, and a Magus, right? Again, it's sort of an obscure example, but it shows you the extent to which uh, a linguistic setting can fire associations that uh, normally, that, that were not originally intended. The Mishnah simply wanted to talk about a place called the Parva Chamber, and yet a rabbi who's familiar with Persian and perhaps with the Persian world will make an association between, right, perhaps he pronounced it, the Paro Chamber and Magus. So much for, for language, and we could say much more about language. But speaking about Zoroastrian priests, um, I want to speak a little about the institutional context, uh, because perhaps we are able to understand what Rav Yosef was trying to say. Again, he is commenting on the name of a, perhaps a foreign sounding name of a temple chamber, and he's associating that with a Zoroastrian priest, or perhaps Zoroastrian priests. In fact, if you look at 4C for a second, you'll find that elsewhere in that same tractate, there is a foreign sounding, or actually foreign Greek uh, named uh, chamber in the temple, which was also associated with a kind of local official, right, known as the Porsi. Now, we don't really know exactly what they were, but we do know from context that they were uh, officials. We also know that this association between this chamber and the officials was a critique of the priesthood. The rabbis famously um, had a very negative association with Second Temple priests. They didn't like the fact that they, that it was a sort of revolving door for the high priest serving on Yom Kippur. They didn't like the fact that there, there seemed to be a lot of fighting between them. Uh, and it's quite possible that what's happening in 4E, and perhaps what's even happening in 4B, is that Rav Yosef is making an a, a critique of the priesthood, um, of the Jewish priesthood, by comparing them with the Zoroastrian priesthood. The Zoroastrian priesthood was not simply a religious uh, entity in the Sasanian Empire. It was, for all intents and purposes, a bureaucracy and a very large one. Many of the people that you would encounter in a court of law were, right, as we would say, ordained Zoroastrian priests. And there were actually specific types of courts which were, in a sense, Zoroastrian courts uh, which had jurisdiction over civil matters uh, as well. Many of the documents, as I mentioned, that we find that have survived, and the, and the steels and the, and the um, bullae, uh, are stamped by Zoroastrian priests. And they seem to have had uh, an enormous influence uh, and really formed a, a major institution uh, that Jews in Babylonia would, would reckon with. So when we think about the Babylonianness of the Babylonian Talmud, Right? It's not that we, we don't, it's beyond just thinking about geography, land, language, and linguistic associations, we have to think about institutions. The institutions that would one, one would encounter every day, right, in a legal context with uh, Zoroastrian priests and others. And also distinctive Jewish institutions, Jewish institutions which were unique to Babylonia. Perhaps the most famous one was the Exilarchate. The Exilarchate and the Exilarch, the Reish Galuta in Aramaic, uh, and also in Persian, because it was a Aramaic loanword uh, into Persian uh, in some Persian texts as well, was a way of organizing the Jewish community, uh, a way of, um, uh, of uh, having an address, perhaps, 
uh, of the Jewish community in Babylonia. And recent work by scholars, particularly one scholar named Jeffrey Herman, uh, and another one named Richard Payne have showed an incredible amount of light on the ways in which the Sasanians really top down organized space for the different religious communities uh, that were living in the empire and created sort of addressees uh, for, um, for these communities. So the Christian community, the Syriac Christian community famously had the Catholicos uh, as, his, as their leader, positioned normally in the capital city, Seleucia Tessiphon, and particularly Tessiphon during this period. Although we're not entirely sure at which point the Exilarch was located in the capital city, they do seem to have been positioned there at some points and were in close proximity uh, to the Sasanians uh, as well. So the institutional context that we need to think about in conceiving of the Babylonianness of the Bavli um, is not just the non-Jewish institutions, that, um, that were encountered with the Jewish institutions, which, just, which, was, which were taken for granted, which were part of the, uh, the everyday. Richard Payne's book, uh, in particular, um, is, uh, is illuminating because he spends <coughs> most of his research trying first to understand what he refers to in the title as the state of mixture, right? That in the Sasanian Empire you had many, many different types of people living there, different language groups, but also different religious communities. And the Sasanians were tasked with a very complicated situation to kind of create uh, cohesive semi-autonomous units for these individual communities, and yet bring them all under some sort of authority uh, and jurisdiction. That could shift. At times, uh, these communities could wield more power than at other times. They never seem to have been able to go as far as formally uh, being able to execute members of their own community. Uh, and sometimes, depending on the political context, particularly with the more vulnerable Syriac Christians and perhaps a perceived association with the Roman and Byzantine empires, um, the, 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 um, the, um, the Sasanians can sort of dive in there and, and get their hands uh, dirty. But the ideal state in this state of mixture was to, was to create, was to allow for semi-autonomous communities uh, to live their lives, to conduct their affairs, uh, all with ultimate kind of obeisance to uh, uh, Sasanian authority. At certain times though, and here you can turn to an example a couple of pages later, uh, under the political context, um, perhaps for economic reasons, uh, the authorities would, would breach that autonomy. And we have a kind of interesting example here. I won't uh, do it in its entirety, but it's worth uh, looking at uh, because it again exemplifies the distinction uh, between Babylonian and Palestine that the rabbis were live to and aware of. This is from the laws of returning lost objects. Right? There is, in fact, an entire chapter of the Mishnah and the Talmuds uh, that deals with the obligation to return lost ob objects. And as the rabbis often do, it's a rather complicated endeavor. It's not just that you find something and you return it, but you have to determine the extent to which that object is still linked to its owner. How do you return it to the owner? What sort of distinguishing marks? It's, it's a full, complex, rabbinic uh, affair. In source number 7a, we have a, at the, in the second paragraph, we have a little uh, anecdote about a rabbi uh, who had lived in Babylonia. The story takes place apparently in Palestine, and of course there was quite a bit of foot traffic in both directions. And this rabbi finds a money bag of dinars, okay? He's faced with a money bag of dinars. Um, he's not exactly sure what to do, uh, perhaps. Uh, perhaps he's scared of what to do. And the story goes as follows. Rabbi Asi found a money bag of dinars, a Roman saw him, and he, Rabbi Asi apparently, was apprehensive. He, the Roman, said to him, take it for yourself. We are not Persians who say lost property belongs to the king. So the rabbi seems to be vacillating. He's not exactly sure whether he will take it, whether he should take it. Perhaps it doesn't have a distinguishing mark. We don't exactly know what the context is. But this Roman observer kind of pipes up uh, and says, no, you know, take it for yourself. 
we, our system of law is different than the Persian system of law. The Roman, as depicted in Babylonian Talmud, seems to say that they're more laissez-faire when it comes to the loss of lost objects. And um, that could be confirmed, perhaps, uh, when we look at the, the Roman law codes. Uh, as always, the Roman law codes uh, tell uh, a complicated story and a complicated history, so I've given you just one snippet from the year 380, which does not, in fact, correspond to when this rabbi uh, lived. Uh, if any person under the inspiration of divine providence or the leadership of fortune should find a treasure tove, we allow him to enjoy his find without any fear. The Romans, too, had a vast area, not of lost objects, but of found objects, so to speak, things that you would dig up um, in your property, right, known as treasure trove. Uh, and one of the stages after the, um, perhaps giving it to the city or giving it to uh, a former <laughs> owner and all different kinds of possibilities, there is one moment when the law codes proudly declare uh, that in fact the person who finds the lost object should keep it. Uh, so yes, you can find within the Roman law codes some uh, willingness to allow finders keepers right, to, to exist. What's more interesting uh, and, 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 and reflects the political context in moments where apparently the Persian authority, the Sasanian authorities wanted to dive in and uh, disturb perhaps the you know, autonomy or semi-autonomy of rabbis fighting lost objects in the street is in source 7C. This is a source from a summary of Zoroastrian law uh, as it existed uh, probably uh, in late antiquity. It's collected in a uh, early medieval book known as the Den Card. And I gave you ve one very small snippet. But this code, the Code of Strays, is a code that looks very much like that second chapter, that, that chapter of rabbinic law which I described. It details what you do with the lost object, what are identifying marks, how do you, uh, how do you decide between one finder and another finder, uh, and it's really, it's an entire, uh, this is just a summary, an entire vast area of, um, of Zoroastrian law. One of the laws uh, asserts, and, 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 and this comes out also in other sections as well, the role that local authorities uh, will play. That it's not enough just to kind of solve these problems uh, locally, um, between two people, I should say, but rather the authorities like to find out what was happening. So in this passage, the keeper of lost property informing the town leader when stray sheep and large cattle arrive in the region. Um, one it seems to be obligated, and these are technical terms uh, within that discourse after that, one seems to be obligated to inform the leaders uh, of strays that come in, and then the leaders would make the determinations themselves. So it could be that this passage, this Talmudic passage, gives us a little inkling of the ways in which politics sometimes were conducted in the Sasanian Empire. Yes, there were these semi-autonomous uh, communities. The Sasanians strove for a stable state of mixture, uh, but sometimes, perhaps for economic reasons or other reasons, they would dive in there and they would make determinations themselves. They wouldn't just allow rabbis uh, to, to take things uh, and give them back uh, at their whim. I want to come to, uh, come to a conclusion, uh, and I wanted to talk about perhaps uh, the area that I'm most interested in, uh, and that is the religious context. Right? When we think about contextualizing the Babylonian Talmud, um, which is ultimately right, a sort of a religious work, a work that's uh, produced by a specific religious community, we need to take into account the religious context. Now, that state of mixture right, that I referred to was a really robust one. We have evidence, hard evidence even, from the third century, an inscription written by a, a high priest, Kirdir, which lists many of the religious groups that lived. We have Brahmins, we have uh, apparently two communities of, of Christians, we have Baptists, perhaps a reference to Mandeans, we have Manichaeans, um, we have Jews, we have Zoroastrians, we have uh, Herod, Herodox, Herodox uh, groups of Zoroastrians. There is kind of a great complex uh, soup of, of different religious communities living in proximity uh, to the rabbis. Now each of these religious contexts means something else. And I just want to focus on uh, two very briefly. 
Uh, first, I just want to talk about Christianity. Uh, because there's a misnomer uh, in, the, in the field of Jewish studies that, uh, that only in Palestine did Jews come into constant contact with uh, Christians. While in Babylonia, this was not something that they regularly experienced. That simply is not true. We have beautiful churches or pieces of churches that have survived from Tessiphon. We have the stucco recently published. Uh, we have uh, texts that were written from these regions in Syriac, a, a, another dialect of Aramaic, not terribly different from Babylonian Jewish Aramaic. Um, and we have all sorts of indications that, in fact, Jews came into regular contact with Christians as they had in, in Roman Palestine. That said, um, because we want to appreciate the Babylonianness of the, of the Babylonian Talmud, we do need to appreciate the fact that these were different Christians. Uh, or many of the Christians that they met, met were part of a different church, right? And this, of course, has to do with major debates, particularly in the fourth century, uh, within, the, within the, uh, the Christian church, dealing with Christology, the, various uh, issues of theology, which caused splits uh, within, uh, within the church. One little window we have into a different encounter with Christians, I wouldn't read it now, but I'll refer to it as in source number six. This is a source in which a Rabbi Abahu, who lived in Caesarea and came into regular contact with people that the Talmud refers to as heretics, but often, based on context, we know that Christians are meant. Um, he praises and he kind of recommends to his uh, Christian friends a Babylonian rabbi named Rav Safra, who is very learned. And the Christians are so happy with this recommendation that they actually exempt him from taxes. Because the learned man, he shouldn't have to, he shouldn't have to pay uh, many taxes. Um, until they meet this Rav Safra, and they learn that he's not very good at, at biblical debate. He can't hold his own with the preacher. Uh, and they go back to Rabbi Abahu and they say, what, what exactly happened here? I thought he was a very learned man. Rabbi Abahu says, and this is at the end of the, that passage, um, we who are found in your midst, meaning in Caesarea, apply ourselves and study the Bible. They, the Babylonian rabbis, who are not found in your midst, do not apply themselves. Now this, again, had uh, previously been misinterpreted as evidence that there were no Christians or no interaction with Christians in the Sasanian Empire. But in fact, what seems to be happening is that the rabbis in Babylonia appreciated that the types of interactions that they had with Christians and the types of interests that Syriac Christianity had were going to be different than what you find in, in Palestine. You don't have what a, a scholar named Mark Kirschman refers to as the rivalry of genius, where Palestinian Jews and Palestinian Christians are battling over specific verses in the Bible. Song of Songs should be interpreted as a relationship between you know, the Israelites and God. No, it should be about uh, the church and, and Jesus. That kind of dialogue and that kind of discourse you did not have, uh, at least to that extent, in, in Babylonia. Instead, right, within this state of mixture, you had different, different communities vying for power. We have some uh, martyrologies in which Christians referred to uh, Jews as taking sides against them. Um, Without going into detail, you have a very different type of set of factors which were dominant in the relationship between Jews and Christians and in the type of Christians that Jews met. That's in terms of Christianity. Um, by, uh, I won't go into the Mandeans, the Manichaeans, but of course a robust contextualization of the Bavli would include all of those. I do want to just uh, almost end with the Zoroastrians and what the types of uh, interactions with the Zoroastrians that would have taken place. And here, it's important to, again, distinguish between that rivalry of genius they would have, let's say, in Palestine, with Jews and Christians battling over a shared canon, the Hebrew Bible, right? And what you found with Jews and Zoroastrians in Babylon. Jews and Zoroastrians came from completely different traditions, right? Zoroastrianism, of course, is, is an Indo-Iranian uh, religion. There is no Bible there, Hebrew Bible there, to speak of. Uh, rather, they... Um, the most important sacred text is known as the Avesta. And then the ground on which Jews and Zoroastrians met was not a textual interpretive ground. Instead, it was often a ritual, shared ritual space. For a variety of reasons, 
So many of the ritual concerns of Jews in Babylonia mirrored, mimicked, looked familiar to Zoroastrians and vice versa. And one example of that would be in the laws of menstruation. Both Babylonian Jews and uh, Sasanian Zoroastrians had elaborate um, codes dealing with uh, what they saw as menstrual impurity. And we often find instead of battling over verses, battling over the best way to deal with these kinds of ritual uh, issues. The story that I have here is again deemed to be one of the stranger stories in the Babylonian Talmud, but it actually makes quite a bit of sense when it's properly contextualized. This is a story of the Sasanian queen mother sending bloodstains to a rabbi to determine whether these are really menstrual or came from another source. It sounds completely bizarre. And it should, I think, nowadays sound completely bizarre. It's probably not historical that a Saudi mother, a queen mother, would actually send such things to a rabbi. But it does tell us about how rabbis would imagine uh, or hope the Sasanian leaders would respect them. They would not respect them uh, by approving of their interpretation of biblical verses. Zoroastrians couldn't care less about the Hebrew Bible. Instead, right, the, the way the rabbis would uh, imagine approval by Zoroastrians would be um, them praising their ability to distinguish between different types of blood uh, in dealing with uh, this area of ritual. In closing, I want to talk about a final context, which sounds sort of funny. I didn't give any examples. I just wrote the words textual context. And this brings me back to Rabbi Yochanan. If you remember, Rabbi Yochanan defined Babylonian learning as distinctly uh, mixed up, right? It's a mixture of scripture, it's a mixture of Mishnah, and of Talmud, of learning on, on the Mishnah. So we already talked about how that complicates the task of locating the Talmud uh, in Babylonia, uh, but there's something else that it tells us uh, that is uh, perhaps indicative of the Babylonian Talmud's context, and that is the only text, apparently, that rabbis created in Babylonia, that Babylonian rabbinic Jews composed and invested themselves in, was the Babylonian Talmud. There was one gargantuan, circa 1.8 million text that the community worked on, produced, and transmitted uh, to this very day. This was not the case in Palestine. In Palestine, there were all different sorts of compositions, the rabbinic Jews and Jews close to rabbinic Jews uh, were invested in. First of all, there were different kinds of volumes of midrash, right, that were produced in Palestine. There was a midrash on Genesis, there was a classical midrash on Leviticus, on Lamentations. There also was um, uh, a whole genre that was a focus, uh, a liturgical genre, known as a uh, piyut. Uh, in Palestine, the rabbis seem to think that it's okay and it makes sense to have sort of different books on the shelf, right? Uh, a variety of books which were self-standing. In Babylonia, for whatever reason, the rabbis decided to organize all of their knowledge on that structure of, of the Mishnah. Right? <laughs> One gargantuan text that they knew as the Talmud uh, was the repository of medical knowledge, uh, recipes, uh, sex handbook, all kinds of texts make their way into this gargantuan uh, text. Interestingly enough, and I'll close with this point, and this is sort of the topic of my research when I finished that book on menstruation, uh, is that Zoroastrians also conceived and organized their knowledge uh, in a similar way during this, this period of antiquity. There is a word uh, which has an interesting history. Uh, uh, it makes its way into Islam. But in certain contexts in late antiquity, in uh, Middle Persian, then uh, refers to the tradition, the Zoroastrian tradition. And in texts like that, uh, Source 7c, right, the, the summary uh, of basically the den, we learn how the Zoroastrians use the organization of the Avesta, sort of parallel if you want to think about it, the Mishnah, to organize everything that they had to say. That would have included the code of strays, it would have included medicine. It would have included all kinds of things that they tried to uh, pour into this one gargantuan text. As late antiquity came to a close, as things sort of fell apart, 
they did produce separate books, and we have separate books at this point, but ultimately, um, the goal was, and we know a little bit about the institutional support for this, was to create one gargantuan den, one sea-like uh, den. So perhaps Rabbi Yochanan was onto something uh, as well uh, there when he appreciated the fact that the Babylonian Talmud was a big mixture of sort of everything, uh, perhaps uh, quite similar to the how Zoroastrians wanted to work. So thank you very much.